Excellent. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to day two of Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2015. This is the third year we've been at Back to Our Past. Uh, this series of DNA lectures is kindly sponsored by Family Tree DNA, who have a stand outside. And uh, do feel free to buy any DNA kits you have from them. Uh, hopefully, you'll learn a lot from uh, this morning's lecture from Debbie, um, who has put together this wonderful uh, talk on um, DNA testing for beginners. Now, uh, Debbie is an honorary clinical associate, honorary research associate, honorary research associate at University College London. She is the author of many books on uh, genealogy, including the Surnames Handbook and DNA and Social Networking, some of which you can get at a discounted price if you buy a DNA test. So we're doing everything. We're bending over backwards, forwards, and sideways to try and convince you to get yourself tested. So um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Debbie to you. I work with her very, very closely over in the UK, and uh, she's a great colleague and a great presenter. So please give a warm welcome to Debbie Kent. for those uh, kind words. I feel a bit embarrassed now. I hope I live up to expectations. <laughs> um, okay, now uh, I have actually made a PDF of this presentation available on my Dropbox account, so if you want to make a note of that, you can download the PDF file, and it's got all of the links on, clickable links, so that you can click through and look at all the, the websites and go back and refer to it. There is actually a lot of information that um, I'm hoping to share with you, and the more you go over it, the more you, you should be able to understand it. Okay, everyone written that down who wants to? Okay. Right, um, so I'm going to be explaining to you this morning about the three different tests that we can take to use for our family history research. Um, the first test we're going to be looking at is the Y chromosome DNA test, or the Y DNA test, and this is the test that follows the direct male line, which is normally the path of surnames. And that can be used for recent genealogy, but also to explore your deep ancestry, going back for 200,000 years or more. The second test that we're going to be looking at is the mitochondrial DNA test, and this explores the direct female line, your mother, her mother, and so on back in time. This, again, can also be used for genealogy within the last um, five or six generations, but also to explore your very deep ancestry, going back about 200,000 years. And the third test, which is the newest of the three tests, is the autosomal DNA test. And this test will give you matches with genetic cousins on all of your different family lines, but the limitation of this test is actually a limitation of the DNA. Um, it's best used for matching um, cousins within about the last five or six generations, so within about the last 200 years or so. It can take you back further than that, but it becomes much more difficult interpreting the results. Okay, so just, uh, before we look at the different tests, I just want to explain about a few of the basic principles of DNA testing that apply to all the tests. First of all, I want you to think of DNA not as something different and uh, scary. It's just another type of record that you use in your DNA research. We don't make conclusions based purely on the DNA. We use it in combination with all the other records before we draw any conclusions. And the other basic principle of a DNA test, you only get value out of a DNA test if you're in a matching database. There are all sorts of companies that will sell you a test, but unless they've got a database, you will get nothing out of it. And the success all depends on who else is in the database. Sometimes people are lucky when they first test and they get a match that would help them. Other times they have to wait. But once you're in the database, you just keep getting notified of matches in the future. And the other important caveat is that um, to make use of this, these tests, we have to make the, the DNA test has to be done on living people. Um, we can't suddenly turn around in 10 years' time when the databases are 10 times the size and say, oh, I wish I'd had a great uncle Ernie, uh, his DNA tested. Um, he's probably been cremated anyway, but uh, I mean, even if you do want to go around digging up cemeteries, you, you have to get permission, and it's very, very difficult and very, very costly. So it's like oral history. If you don't get it done now, if you don't get that interview done with your Auntie Nellie or whoever, you've lost that chance if you don't do it when you can but it can sometimes be a long-term investment. Um, now, at Family Tree DNA, you can um, nominate a beneficiary for your account, and this is something I would advise everyone to do. So, and if you get your parents tested, make sure you get them to nominate you as the beneficiary. 
Um, so th that's something that's very, very important to do. Um, now, how can we use DNA testing for our genealogy research? First of all, we can just use it to verify existing family trees. And we can use it to test um, hypotheses about particular relationships. So if you've got two people with the same surname, you can't trace their lines back any further. If you do a DNA test, it will tell you whether or not those two men share a common ancestor. And if you've got, say, two people and you're not sure if they share the same great-grandfather or great-grandmother, you can do an autosomal DNA test and check that they share the expected amount of DNA in common. It can be very useful for helping with brick walls if you've got an illegitimacy in your line or if, if you're adopted. And this is something that really relies on the power of the databases. As the databases get larger and larger, the chances of people overcoming those brick walls get much, much bigger. Sometimes it can just um, give you a geographical focus for your research. Um, so if your ancestors went off wandering, I've got lots of people in London and trying to research in London is impossible and they, they usually come from somewhere else. Um, if you then match with someone who's from a particular part of Ireland or the, the UK, uh, then you've actually got that focus for your research and then rather than focusing on a whole country or a whole continent, you can just hone in on the particular region. So you're, what you're really hoping for is that the people you match have done all your family history research for you and they save you all the trouble. It doesn't always work out that way, but sometimes you, you can strike, uh, strike lucky and uh, find the right people. Within a surname project, um, we can actually look at surnames, how many different lineages there are for a particular surname, and we can look at different variant spellings and the origin and evolution of a surname. A lot of us in the Guild of One Name Studies are actually running um, DNA projects, and we're using DNA in that way just to look at the surnames that we're researching. And it can just be fun to take a DNA test just to see what it throws up and to see who you match. Um, and it, it's just something rather nice about having that genetic relationship with someone, even if you don't, or can't even work out how you're related. And one important caveat, if you don't want to uh, know the answer, don't ask the question. Sometimes people don't get the answers that they were expecting. Um, DNA does sometimes show up surprises, as does family history research sometimes show up surprises. Um, and once that knowledge is there, you can't undo it. We have had one case of babies um, who were mixed up in hospital that was uh, thrown up by DNA testing. We do sometimes have uh, men testing who find out they're not their father's son. But those cases are very rare. And in fact, normally when these things do come to light, people, it's the, the sort of closure. People just like to have that knowledge that they, that they've about their identity. And lots and lots of adoptees who are just desperate to have that knowledge of their identity. And, just, and DNA does provide the way of, of giving you that. OK, so the first test we're going to look at in more detail is the Y chromosome DNA test. And um, the Y chromosome is one of the sex chromosomes. So if you're a female, you have two X chromosomes. And if you're a male, you have an X chromosome that you get from your mother, and you have a Y chromosome that you get from your father. So of course, the important point about this is that only men can take this test. Um, but um, there are lots and lots of females involved in DNA testing, so when we're usually the ones who are out there recruiting people and uh, running the surname projects and trying to get all our men to, uh, to swab for us and have their DNA tests. You'll notice all the volunteers on the Family Tree DNA stand, they're all females, all desperate to get people into their projects. Um, now, if, when you do a Y chromosome DNA test, it's important to do it in a surname project, and there are now over 8,400 different surname projects. And um, there are, I don't know how many different variants spelling. So all the common surnames are represented in a surname project and a lot of very rare surnames. You may, if you do have a particularly rare surname, then there may not be a project for you. But there are also lots of geographical projects. There's a very large Ireland DNA project that you can join and there are various regional projects for Ireland as well. So do make sure you join the project and then you get the help from the volunteer project administrator who will also help to interpret your results for you. So the, the test works on the principle that the Y chromosome, when it's passed on from the father to son, is passed on virtually unchanged. But just every now and then, in that copying pro process, you get little mutations that occur, like little typos. If you're copying a piece of paper, every now and then you get little blemishes. And then once those mutations occur, they then get passed on to the next generation. 
So the DNA test looks at particular markers on the Y chromosome where these mutations are known to occur. And then it's really like a number matching game. Each marker you get a number, and then all your numbers go into a big database, and then they're all compared, um, and then that's how the, the matching process works. So it's a bit like a sort of lottery, except the advantage of this is that you don't have to keep paying every week to, to be in the, the lottery. You just stay in there, and then the more people that test, the more people you, you like to get matches with. So this is what a DNA test result would look like at the bottom here. It's just a string of numbers, and you might well think, what is that going to tell me? And the answer is absolutely nothing on its own. The whole value of the test is actually in the comparison process. So what, normally the more markers that match, the closer the relationship, and then if you have too many mismatching markers, then we say that there's no relationship in a genealogical time frame or in the time when surnames came into being. And this is just a sample from one of my projects. Normally we would test at a minimum of 37 markers. I can't fit 37 numbers on the PowerPoint slide there. But these are, all, these are results for five men, all with the same surname. And you can see the top two rows, every single number is identical. So they have what's called a perfect match. And we know that confirms that those two men, they share the same surname and they share a common male ancestor. On the next two lines, you can see that the numbers almost match. There's just one number that's different. So again, one mismatch is OK. That's within what we, we expect. Um, so again, those men are related. Um, so all, all four men are related. But what does sometimes happen, as I've got in the microp chain here, when you just have one mutation, sometimes that can define different branches of the tree. So I've got two men, um, I think it's in Canada, who have number 28, and then two men back in England who have the number 27 on that marker. So even without having any paper trail, if I had another DNA result, I could tell just by that marker number which branch they belong to. And then the bottom line, you can see that all the different, there's so many different numbers there, um, that those two men, even though that, that, that man, even though he's got the same surname and he's from the same part of Devon, he does not share a common ancestor with those people. We do get sometimes people who are desperate to prove they've got a match. We did have one person who was trying to explain his mismatch with chaos theory, but I'm afraid that's a very novel idea and it just doesn't work. So if they, the results don't match, then um, you, you just have to go back and look at your paper trail records and there's going to be another explanation. Um, when you're taking a test, um, normally the, the standard entry-level test is now the 37 marker test, and that's the one I would recommend that you start with, and you can upgrade uh, for the same, uh, there's no extra expense if you upgrade at a later date to 67 or 111 markers, it's not always necessary to do that. If you are trying to explore an illegitimate line, I would always recommend having at least 67 markers because when you're looking at matches with other surnames, you need that extra confidence of the additional markers. Um, I'll, I won't go through all of that, but you can look at the PDF um, afterwards just for the extra detail. So when you get your results in, this is what it looks like. You get a personal page on the Family Tree DNA website, and you've got all sorts of things that you can explore there, but the most important part of the results is the page where it shows your matches. And these are my dad's matches at 37 markers. His surname is Cruz, C-R-U-W-Y-S. And you can see on there that he's got matches with other people with the same surname, um, which was very handy. So at least we know that um, he, he's from the right line. And, uh, um, and also he's got matches with other surnames. Now, it is quite common to find matches with other surnames. Um, especially when you get the matches are more distant. Can you see where it says genetic distance? That shows the number of mismatching markers. So when it's a genetic, genetic distance of one, that's only one mismatching marker. When it's a genetic distance of four, that's four mismatching markers. Um, and when you get out to that level, sometimes those matches, they can be with, uh, they can predate the formation of surnames. So, and it is quite common, especially with Scottish and Irish names, you do actually tend to get matches with a number of different surnames. That's more to do with the surname history, and you've got clans and septs and things. Uh, so the, the surnames are much more fluid. 
Um, the results, we normally put them on a project website. This is, these are the results for my um, cruise project, and each colour band represents a, a, new, a different genetic family. So all the people in that first blue group, they all have matching DNA results. And you, can, you may just be able to see they've all got slightly different variant spellings and they're from all over the place. I've got one line from Ireland, I've got one from Cornwall, some from Devon, some in America. And we also have an interloper, we have a, a Mr Rainey in that group. And this is something that does happen quite often. Um, this is what we call an NPE. Um, the Emily Alicino has coined a very nice word for this, not the parent expected. Um, so I mean, the, these are quite common. Um, sometimes you already know that you've got uh, an NPE from your paper trail. In this case, the person didn't know. He'd been sitting in the family tree DNA database, didn't match anyone else from his rainy project, and he'd been in there for years and years. And then one of my project members tested, and they had a perfect match. And when they looked at their records, this was actually in America, and they were both in the same place in, I think it was South Carolina or somewhere, and the two families were living side by side. So. Uh, um, there are a lot of things like that uh, that do tend to happen, but um, quite often you do know in advance. Um, I just wanted to share a little story with you just to show you the power of DNA testing, um, in, sometimes in the absence of paper trail records. Um, this is, uh, I had a, somebody contact me before I'd even started doing DNA testing, looking for help. Um, researching his ancestor Henry Cruz and according to the family stories Henry Cruz was the sole survivor of a shipwreck off the coast of South Africa and he was supposed to be the only person could, who could swim and he managed to swim ashore and this bay in South Africa in Hawkston is actually called Harry's Bay in his honour. But the problems arose when he started to look at the South African records um, and there was just nothing that would provide any clues about Henry's origins. We had a death notice from South Africa, which gave us his um, date of death in 1862, and his age of death, age 36 years, and it told us he was born somewhere in Great Britain. So we were now trying to look for someone who was born in 1826, somewhere in England, somewhere in Scotland, somewhere in Wales. At least that had ruled out Ireland. Um, but. Um, so he actually was one of the first people who joined my DNA project. He'd spent a huge amount of money researching cruises in all sorts of um, different English counties, trying to find a Henry Cruise at the right date, and all of them were, um, they, they were all drawing a blank, and they, they were either died or we found them still in English records. Um, but then eventually we got the answer through DNA testing. This is his match page, and in fact he matches another one of his relatives from the same line now. But you can see that all the matches, um, three of them are from this line in Ogborn St George in Wiltshire. The other one is from Berkshire, and in fact that Berkshire tree fits in with the Ogborn St George tree. So now as a result of this DNA test, we know exactly which tree he belongs to, and we're now just trying to make the connection. Unfortunately it goes through London, which just does rather complicate matters. But now we've, that really has provided the focus for the research, so we know where to start looking rather than having to look all over the place. Um, now I just wanted to go back to this page. Now the other part of the test results that you get is your haplogroup. And the haplogroup is the thing that tells you about your deep ancestry. And that's this, you can see those colours there, the red and, um, and uh, green colours there. Um, the, uh, let me just go to the next page. Now the haplogroups, they can be informative to a certain extent about your deep ancestry. Uh, because the haplogroups, they, they have their own geographical distribution patterns. So if you were a haplogroup um, H, for example, you would be from India. If you were a haplogroup A, you would be from Africa. If you were a haplogroup C4, you'd be an Australian Aborigine. Um, so you can actually, there's a certain amount that you can learn just by knowing the haplogroup itself. In Ireland, about 90% of Irish men are going to be haplogroup R1B. Um, and knowing that your haplogroup R1B on its own it probably isn't that helpful, but there are extra tests you can go on and take, and to, which will help you to determine which particular sub-branch of R1B that you belong to. And some of the talks later on today will be exploring that in more detail, so I won't go into that now. 
But if you are interested in exploring your deep ancestry, then make sure once you know your haplogroup, group, you join the relevant haplogroup group project. There are lots and lots of haplogroup group projects, all run by volunteers who are experts in their particular part of the, the Y tree. And they are very, very helpful at offering advice and telling you which is the best test to take if you want to go on that deep ancestry route. And just a word of warning about the haplogroups, we have got a couple of British companies, unfortunately, who get, tend to get rather carried away um, with storytelling about haplogroups and how people are... There was the Hairy Bikers, I haven't yet seen it, but last week they, were, they had some programme on where they were telling the Hairy Bikers that they were Vikings and all sorts of uh, things. The haplogroups are not associated with being Viking or being Viking or being Celtic or being a Pict. Um, but the, the, the haplogroups tell us about the about living people and the distribution of the haplogroups today. They do not tell us about the distribution of haplogroups 1,000, 2,000 years ago. Um, so you have to be very careful drawing conclusions. We've got a website set up at UCL where we sort of debunk some of these myths from some of the, uh, the dodgier companies out there if you wanted to have a look at that. Um, okay, so the next test I want to look at is the mitochondrial DNA test. Uh, mitochondrial DNA is passed on by a mother to both her male and female children, so everyone can take a mitochondrial DNA test. And this test traces your direct maternal line, so your mother, her mother, and so on back in time. And this is probably the, the most, the least useful of the three tests. And one of the problems is that surnames are not passed on by a mother to her daughter. So you don't have that surname clue when you're trying to recruit people to test. But also it does have quite a low mutation rate. So it will give you a match, but the match could be 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, which is not quite so helpful. But until recently, whenever you read stories about DNA testing in the news and ancient DNA <coughs> testing, it was always mitochondrial DNA that was used. Um, so things like Richard III, that was mitochondrial DNA. Um, so I've just put this chart up just to um, show you again the line of inheritance. I, I find people always get very confused about mitochondrial DNA, but it is just this one very specific line. It's not every ancestor on your mother's side, it's just that all-female line of inheritance. So, and then the males, they're effectively a dead end, so the male receives the mitochondrial DNA but cannot pass it on. There are two different types of mitochondrial DNA tests that, we can, uh, that you can take. Um, now, um, it, it, when, you, when the test first came out, you, you had the low resolution test, but the cost of um, sequencing has actually plummeted in the last few years. And now I would suggest if you're going to do a mitochondrial DNA, DNA test, you may as well do what's called the full sequence test. So this is the mitochondrial genome, and we can now sequence the whole thing, every single base pair on that genome, 16569 letters. Um, there is a, a test called the mtDNA plus test, which just tests that little bit at the top, that little blue bit called the control region, which is only about 10%, but um, it's not really worth doing that uh, these days. Um, and the, these, the, the full sequence test is on special offer at the, the show here today. So it's cheaper than the price I've got there. I can't offhand the exact price. Now with mitochondrial DNA again, you get a, a matching page on the Family Tree DNA database. And these are my matches, and you can see that the, they give you their most distant known ancestors. You can see that I've got matches with um, someone from, with ancestry from Spain and someone with ancestry from Romania. So you can see that it's, those matches are actually quite distant. With mitochondrial DNA, what we're looking for is someone with an exact match. I've got, you can see the genetic distance 1 and 3 for those. I don't have anyone who matches me exactly with mitochondrial DNA. But even when it is an exact match, it can still be very, very distant. Um, family tree DNA reckon that if you have an exact match, the common ancestor might have lived about, fi uh, about 550 years ago, 95% of the time. But that still means that 5% of those matches will be outside that time frame. But um, it can still be very useful um, if you, in, a, in combination with other records and also for purposes of elimination sometimes as well. And again, with mitochondrial DNA, we get um, haplogroups. And the haplogroups, the letters and numbers are completely different from the Y DNA haplogroups, just to make life difficult for us. 
Um, now, in Europe, we've got a number of prevalent haplogroups. Haplogroup H is the most predominant one. That's around about 40% or more um, throughout Europe and in Ireland as well. And there are a number of other ones that are at lower frequency. Um, sometimes the, the capital group on its own can provide useful clues. We do have a, some people who take a test and discover their haplogroup group M, and that's normally found in India. And that's, if you're haplogroup group M, that's normally a legacy of uh, an ancestor who was out uh, in India in the, the time of uh, the, uh, the empire. And if you're, say, a Native American, then you have a capital group A, B, C, or D. So lots of Americans are desperate to have Native American ancestry, and this is one way that sometimes you can actually prove that connection. And with mitochondrial DNA, again, there are lots of haplogroup group projects, so do make sure you jo join the relevant haplogroup group project. There's a list in the ISOG wiki. I run the haplogroup group U4 project. We've now got about 800 members in that, so if anyone's haplogroup group U4, I'd be very pleased to see you in my project. And the, one of the nice things about mitochondrial DNA is you can compare your results with the, some of the ancient DNA specimens. There's a website called Eupadia where they've got all the uh, famous DNA um, haplotypes and haplogroups. So if you take a DNA test and you discover that you are a haplogroup J1C2C, then um, you should be able to claim Richard III as your uh, relation. Um, he's actually got a very rare signature, and there's only a very small number of men in the whole, people in the whole world at the moment who actually have a match for his uh, signature. So uh, the chances are low, but you just never know. Um, now, with Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, um, the only company that um, I would recommend, that anyone would recommend using now, uh, the Family Tree DNA, they've been around since the year 2000. They have the world's largest database of Y-chromosome DNA results, over half a million now. They have over 8,400 surname projects. They have the world's largest database of mitochondrial DNA results. Um, they have more full mitochondrial sequence results than um, any of the academics. Uh, so some of the family tree DNA results are sometimes you can actually contribute your, your results to scientific research if you want to. And they are also have a, they have a partnership with something called the Genographic Project. And that now has over 700,000 participants all over the world. And those people can transfer their results to family tree DNA. So what it means is it's actually a very rich international database. We've got people in the database from Russia, Poland, um, Turkey, all over the world. Um, so whatever, your, um, whatever line you're tracing and wherever it's from, you, you, you should find people in the database from, that, uh, from those uh, countries. Asia is perhaps the only um, continent that's badly uh, underrepresented in all of the databases. Um, now, a lot of surname projects have offers for free DNA tests. Um, when, make sure you have a look at the poster by the Family Tree DNA stand. We've got a list of all the surnames that are offering free DNA tests. These are surname project administrators who've got sponsorship from their project because they want more men in their project, and particularly men from Ireland. Um, because a, a lot of the American projects in particular, they are desperate to find out where they're from in Ireland, so they're very happy to pay for all of you to be tested um, in the hope that they're going to match you. So do have a look at that list of results, and it's also the, the page is also up on the ISOG wiki, so um, do check that regularly to see if your name is included on there. The final test I'm going to be looking at is the autosomal DNA test. And this is the one that gives you matches with your genetic cousins on all of your different family lines. Now, we actually have three different companies that offer this test. Um, 23andMe is primarily a health test, um, and that's the main focus of that test. So that's probably not the best of options for, for most people here today. Um, so it's normally the, the two companies that we would normally use, Family Tree DNA and Ancestry, um, now, if you're an American, you can test with all these companies and the price is exactly the same. It's $99 regardless of which company. But if you're Irish or if you're British, it's a very different picture. Um, Ancestry and 23andMe both charge lots of money for shipping. And also, they charge us a lot more for the tests. So when you actually add in all the factors, if you want to buy a um, DNA test from Ancestry... Um, it would cost you 161 euros. If you want to buy it from Family Tree DNA, it only costs you 97 euros. 
So for that reason, most people over here, um, one of the things I should say about autosomal DNA is it helps to have lots of close relatives tested. So that's another reason why we tend to use family tree DNA, because um, it's just so much cheaper. Why pay more when you actually can get much more from, from one company? Um, the databases are all very different sizes. Family Tree DNA, DNA have actually been going, doing, offering their autosomal DNA tests for about three, four years now. Ancestry DNA have only just launched theirs. So Ancestry, on paper, have a massive database with one million people, but it is about 95% in America. So if you're trying to find those connections with America, then that's fine. A lot of Irish people are, but it's going to take time for that database to build up. Now, Family Tree DNA have been selling their tests for three years. They have a smaller database, but um, it's a better database for people um, in the UK and in, um, in Ireland. And they also have all sorts of tools that the other companies don't offer. So um, you may not know what raw segment data is at the moment or a chromosome browser, but those are tools that we all find really, really useful to use, which you don't get from Ancestry. But if you're, look, if you're adopted or you've, you've got a, a sort of um, an illegitimacy, it's best to be in all the databases because you just never know where those matches are, are going to come from. And if you do test with Ancestry, you can transfer your results to the Family Tree DNA database. And the transfer is free, but you, there's a small fee of $39 um, just to, do the, to unlock the, the matches. Okay, so what do we actually mean by autosomal DNA? Um, so we looked, saw earlier, we actually have 46 pairs of, we have 46 um, chromosomes. The chromosomes come in pairs. We have one set of chromosomes from our mother and one set of chromosomes from our father. And one pair of those chromosomes, they're the sex chromosomes. So if you're a female, you get the, the two X's, and if you're a male, you get an X and a Y. And the other ones are called autosomes. Now, the key feature of the autosomes is that they recombine, so the DNA gets shuffled up. So the DNA that you get from your parents is actually like a patchwork of the DNA from all four of your great-grandparents. So unlike the Y chromosome, you don't have that strict inheritance pattern. And now, this test can be taken by both males and females. And it's, it, it gives you a representation of all of your ancestors on all of your family lines. But it's best used for matching with cousins within about the last five or six generations, about the last 200 years or so. And this works on the principle of matching DNA segments. DNA is passed on in big chunks, and you get big chunks of DNA from your parents, and then uh, as each generation passes, those chunks of DNA start getting smaller and smaller. So the larger the segment and the more segments you share in common, the closer the match is. And of course, the difficulty is that when you've got a match with a um, third or fourth cousin, it could be on any one of your family lines. So then it's the, the difficulty of going back to the paper trail and seeing if you can find the connection. And because of the more limited time frame with this one, you really need to make sure you test the oldest living relatives first. And um, it also is really, really helpful to test other close relatives um, to get the confirmation of the, the matches and also for the purposes of elimination. So if you test yourself and a, say, a second cousin and you both match another person in the database, then you know it's on that same line as your second cousin. So this is how the inheritance process works. Um, I, would, if you're gonna, I would recommend you have a look at the page in the ISOF wiki on autosomal DNA statistics. Um, we get 50% of our DNA from our parents and we get roughly 25% from our four grandparents. But we don't, it's not an exact amount of DNA that we get from our grandparents. You may get 28% from one grandparent and only 22% from another. And then as each generation passes, the amount of DNA that you get in common is diluted. And then you only have a very small amount of DNA that you share in, com share in common with the more distant relatives. And the other thing about um, autosomal DNA is um, that um, as time progresses, we actually start to lose ancestors from, what, from our genetic tree. So you will have some parts of your family tree where you just simply have not inherited any DNA 
from those ancestors. So this is another reason for testing as many people as possible. So if you test your sibling, they may just have that DNA from the, the ancestors that you don't have. And that's also a good reason for testing your parents, if you can. So I've tested my parents, so that actually takes me back one further generation, and so that will actually help to uh, fill in some of those gaps there. Um, if you're trying to test a, a particular hypothesis about relationships, these tests work best with the very close relationships. So. Um, if you test two second cousins uh, and they don't match, then you need to start asking questions. But um, for the more distant relationships, the chances of matching are, they start to decrease with each generation. Um, so when you get out to something like the fourth cousin level, only about 50% of um, fourth cousins will actually show up as a match. Ancestry have do something called phasing, which they claim, which in theory should improve the confidence of the matches, but because they don't provide us with the data so we can verify that the matches, um, it's more difficult to actually know if that is working in practice. It's still very early days with autosomal DNA with the interpretation of results, so things keep changing and they probably will continue to change over the, the years. So it, um, but the, one of the features, though, is that when you do take a test, you will end up with lots and lots of matches with fifth and distant cousins, simply because we have so many more fifth and distant cousins. So those will be most of your matches, but you probably won't be able to find the connections with the very distant cousins. And with autosomal DNA, this, I'm showing you screenshots from family tree DNA. This is, um, you, you get a page of matches, in fact, you get pages and pages of matches, and this is what it looks like. Um, so I've tested both of my parents, and luckily they uh, turned out to be uh, correctly my uh, parents. And I tested my son, and he turned out to be my son, fortunately. Um, and also you get the predicted relationship. So here you can see I've got these other people, they're predicted to be my second to fourth cousins. And it goes on, I've got about 500 matches, um, and most of them are actually fifth to distant cousins. And then it's a question of trying to contact your matches, you get the email addresses of your matches, and trying to work out how you're related to the other people. Um, I just wanted to show you the, the segment process. This is a comparison between a grandfather and a granddaughter. Okay, so the orange segments there are the bits of DNA, the chunks of DNA that they share in common. Um, and you can see that it's quite a random process and they've got, let's say on chromosome 18 there, there is, they don't share any DNA in common at all, whereas on, um, say, chromosome um, 14 there, they share the entire chromosome. So it's a very random process and then over time those blocks of DNA start to go away. So once we get out to third cousins, you can see they only share a few small blocks of DNA in common there. This is what we call the chromosome browser. This is what's something you get from family tree DNA that you don't get from um, ancestry. And I just think it really helps to understand the sort of biology, just having these features there. Um, now, if you're lucky, um, the people you match will have listed their surnames. And I'm just going to show you one, one example from my own research where um, the autosomal DNA was very, very helpful. This is actually my... Um, my dad's matching page and one day I looked at the results and this person, um, he had the surname Cruz in his surname list and if you share the same surname it's highlighted in bold. And this person was in Canada and all his ancestry was from Prince Edward Island in Canada and we had a possible link um, through my dad's uh, tree from Devon where we thought somebody had emigrated and they'd gone out to Canada. Um, but this was something we'd not been able to, to prove through the paper trail records um, because um, that this person just disappeared from the records after the 1841 census in the UK and I'd found someone in Canada who had the same surname who I thought might have been the same person but I had no way of proving it. I even managed to get a marriage certificate from the archives in Charlottetown. You can't see that very well but... Um, all it gave me was the name of the, the bride and the groom. No other information, no other identifying information. So we just had nothing that would connect the um, family in Canada with our family in um, England. But the, the, the autosomal DNA result was able to firm that up and also we had a match with the Y DNA as well. But the key thing about this is the match was not with someone with the Cruz surname, he actually had a different surname. 
So the autosomal DNA can pick up matches on all your different surname lines, even if it's not the, the Y DNA, DNA line that's of interest. And this is what it looks like in the chromosome browser. My dad on the left, you can see he shares three um, large segments of DNA. And I've tested as well, and you can see I've only got one segment of DNA. So you can see how the DNA just gets dropped off each generation. And we, do, we are starting to see some really nice success stories from DNA for problems that were previously insoluble. This is a lovely story of... Um, uh, Michelle Rooney, she was actually a foundling, and at, at birth, um, she was literally thrown out with the rubbish, and she was known as the dustbin baby. Um, someone came along and heard her crying and just managed to rescue her before the dustbin lorry came along to uh, um, throw out the carrier bag. And she was brought up by foster parents, and she took a DNA test with family tree DNA, and she had a match with a first cousin. And the first cousin went back to her and they were looking at the family trees. And the first cousin thought that perhaps her uncle, he seemed to be in the right place at the right time, might have been the person who was Michelle's father. So they got the, she got her uncle to take a DNA test and it came back as a parent-child relationship. So Michelle was able, she was actually able to go and meet her father. Sadly, he actually died um, it was only, I think it was about six months after she, she met him, but she actually had that opportunity to meet him, and they got on really, really well. And then, as a result of the publicity, her mother also came forward, and this, this was quite recently. They didn't have to take a DNA test. You can tell just by looking at them that they are related, but they did test as well, and they came back parent-child relationship too. So we're going to see more and more stories like this coming out. So all those um, people who were in um, nunneries and all sorts of things and all, all, of, all sorts of stories now should be solved. But it depends on the power of the database. So the more people we get in these databases, the more we will solve these mysteries. And it may be, even if you take a DNA test and you don't get any results out of it, your results may help somebody else, like that first cousin who solved Michelle's problem. Um, now, the other part of the autosomal DNA test results that you get are these um, so-called ethnicity reports. Um, I think of these really as entertainment value. Um, they're okay at the continental level. Um, they, can dis they can distinguish between Asian... Um, European and African DNA, but they can't distinguish at the fine level between Irish DNA and British DNA or French DNA and German DNA. They will try and give you percentages from different countries, but they're not accurate. And these results do not correlate with your genealogy, so don't be surprised if the results don't match. Um, and also you get different results from the different testing companies. These are my results from Family Tree DNA, and they think I'm 56%, 57% British Isles. Um, and I've got pretty similar results from Ancestry. They think I'm 56.7% British and Irish, and they give me a little bit of Sardinian in there just for entertainment. Um, and Ancestry, they're completely different. They think I'm only 21% British and I'm 20% Irish. And I have just one Irish great-great-great-grandmother. Um, I do have one great-grandfather who possibly has a little bit of Irish ancestry that I can't trace at the moment. Um, and also the other thing that you find is um, lots of the Americans come out with really high percentages. So I quite often match with Americans and they are 85% or 90% British and there's me with my little 21% of British. Um, <laughs> but um, the, these results, they are improving all the time as more reference uh, populations are added. We're actually on the second version of all these um, ethnicity reports for all the companies at the moment and they probably will keep improving over time. Um, I just wanted to mention this website briefly. This is a free website called GEDmatch, um, which um, I recommend everyone um, uses. And regardless of which company you've tested with, you can upload your results to the, this database. And they've got all sorts of tools that you can use. And you can, if, you've got, if you come across someone who's tested at 23andMe and you've tested at Family Tree DNA, you can put both results on this database and you can do all the comparisons. They've got a chromosome browser and all sorts of fancy tools. And if you want, want to look at all those ethnicity reports, they've got a whole bewildering range of populations that give you percentages from whatever population you fancy. Whether or not it means anything, I don't know, but it can still be fun to play around with. 
And there are lots and lots of resources. ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, is the major resource for um, genetic genealogy. We have a um, website and a wiki. There's a very active Facebook group. There's all sorts of mailing lists. And if you want to keep up with all the advances, you really need to follow some of the blogs. And I sometimes write about DNA on my own blog. We've got a very nice active community, um, lots of people who are very knowledgeable, so if you join one of the mailing lists or the Facebook group and you have questions, there's always going to be someone who can help with an answer. On the PDF, all these links will be clickable, so you can just click straight through from there to get all the pages. And um, just lastly, I wanted to say I've got the two books, the DNA book I couldn't bring with me because it's too heavy, but it is available on Kindle, and I have got a few copies of my surname's handbook with me if you wanted to buy that, and it's a special offer if you buy a DNA test at the same time. So just to sum up, we've been looking um, this morning at um, the three different types of DNA tests. So the Y DNA test is the test that follows the direct father line, the surname line. The mitochondrial DNA test follows the direct maternal line. And the autosomal DNA test is the one that will give you matches on all of your different family lines. It's very important to test people while you still have the chance. Um, at the moment, these sort of tests are best used if you've got a particular hypothesis you want to explore. But um, it can be fun to go on what we call a fishing trip just to see what's going to throw up, what the databases are going to throw up. Um, because when you take a test, you just never know what you're going to catch. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. And that's my book, by the way. <laughs> um, any questions for Debbie? Yeah, we have a question here. <coughs> Um, can you just tell us how you nominate a beneficiary? How do you go about it, please? Um, well, it's up to you. You need to ask the, the, the person. You need to ask the person who's doing the test. It's up, up to them to choose who they want. So, um, if you're, if say, say if you're testing your father, you have to ask, You can all act act as his kit manager. Um, and you can then put your name on there. If he, is, but you have to get the agreement from the person who's doing the test. It'd be like a will if I wanted to pass my own onto somebody else. Yes, it's up to you who you choose, and you, you need to make sure the person <coughs> you're nominating is happy to do that. Well, you, do you need to tell the company that you've got to test with? Well, it's all on the form. You just well, name, you the put the name of the person okay. in their email address right, so that okay. um, they can then contact that person. If you don't have anyone to nominate, you can also uh, just nominate the person who runs the, the, the project that you're in. That's for Family Tree DNA. There's yes. a special yes. uh, page on your web page that has beneficiary. You can put your beneficiary de details there. What about Ancestry and 23 Me? They don't have anything like that. I mean, it's, I think it's something that people can put in their wills. It's the same with all, all the databases that you use. I think we, we now need to, we're at the stage where you need to have instructions in your will as to what to do with your digital heritage because so much of our time is spent online. It, it applies just as much to things like Facebook accounts and, um, and Twitter accounts and Google Plus accounts. And relatives can't access Facebook accounts when someone's passed away unless they've got the password. Yeah, so I thought it would be a good idea to yes. actually put your password in a safe place along with your papers yes. so that you can now leave it to your uh, descendants. Yeah. Uh, question over here. I have a question here. I, I did the autosome question here several months ago, and I got like a hundred, over 105 pages of right. results. Now, I had my brother then, I he purchased as a gift for him a Y-DNA test. I think I did the 12. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Got that back, but it's not, unfortunately, he doesn't get the family finder benefit that I get. He just gets a list of people, as you were showing on the screen. So what is your recommendation? Should I upgrade to another test, or does he upgrade to another test? You want your brother to do a family finder test as well, because okay, he will so get matches that he gets okay. matches that you don't get. And if he's only done 12 markers, I would upgrade to 37 markers. Okay, so uh, it's an upgrade to 37 and an upgrade for him to the to autosomal? The, to the family finder, the family. yes. Is There's the family finder the autosomal? 
It is, yes. It is. Um, the, there's an upgrade sale um, at the show here. I think it's 15% off if you order an upgrade while you're at the show. So if, if you've got access to his account, you can order that here. Okay, okay, that's lovely. So he does not need to take another swap because they already have his sample. <laughs> he won't try okay. to work that problem. Okay, question from TikTok. Uh, I had suspected two Irish people in Canada were related closely. Yep. So I paid for the DNA, Y DNA tests that I think six to seven markers for each. Right. And they came very close. Yep. Is there an advantage now to doing some other type of Y DNA test or the autosomal test? Can, can it be refined enough to say these are siblings versus first cousins using any of those tests? What, what is the um, possible relationship? What do you think the relationship is? How I close? Think they're either brothers or first cousins. You think the two men in Canada are brothers or first cousins? Well, in that case, the family finder test will give you definitive answers as to whether or not they're brothers or first cousins. Are you, are you talking about the ancestors or the actual two people who've tested? The two people. So the two people who've tested, if... So they, they were both adopted? But the ones going back. These are male descendants of the two people. So how, far, how many generations back? Uh, let's see. Right, so the family finder test could possibly help with that if the percentages are what is expected of those relationships. But you may also get an answer eventually from Y-DNA with something like the big Y test, although that's still quite an expensive option at the moment. Um, anyway, perhaps we can talk about that later because that gets a bit complicated. And, and if I have a mitochondrial test with a genetic distance of zero, that means there is a common maternal, maternal, maternal ancestor somewhere, it just could be a long way back. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions? We have one question here. I'd like to ask a hypothetical question. Yeah. Uh, a family of uh, two families and ten children. Right. right? And uh, two brothers marry two sisters. So these ten children right. uh, are the products. Uh, and they get their biggest DNA test on. Will the DNA, DNA test hypothetically suggest that they're almost brothers and sisters to each other? Yes, it will. Um, it gets much more complicated with um, situations like that, trying to interpret the results, because instead of inheriting DNA from one side, they end up inheriting segments from both sides. Um, so that needs specialist interpretation and it, it, what happens is you end up with bigger chunks of DNA as well, they survive for longer. Um, right, so if those two groups of families uh, didn't know each other, got the test done, hypothetically would it show up that they were not lost brothers and sisters? Um, you know what I mean, brothers to each other? Well, it, it depends how far back the relationship is. Um, but if it's when you've got cousins marrying, you end up, the relationship predictions are are out. So rather, they, it might show up as being, say, first cousins, predicted first cousins, when in fact they're third cousins. Right. But it wouldn't hypothetically show that they could theoretically be seen as brothers and sisters, or brothers and brothers. You know what I mean? From one to the other. In other words, the male of one family could be, you know, the male of the other. Well, you, you'd have to do the interpretation. All you get from the company is a prediction of the relationship. So it's the relationship of the two people who've tested. So it will predict that they are first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, or third to fifth cousins, or whatever. Um, it's then up to you to look at the records and to, to, to do the interpretation, look at how much DNA they shared to try and work out if it is the relationship range. That's something, again, I would suggest you ask for specialist help in one of our ISOG groups for interpretation of the data. Thank you. There's a hypothetical question. Yeah. <laughs> Very good question as well. There's a lot more of that uh, cousins marrying cousins, mm. especially when you come from a small rural community. How many people have ancestors who came from a small rural community? Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay, and on that note, I think we could just thank Debbie for a fascinating talk, some great question and answer sessions.